Good morning, everyone. Today, we will be presenting our solution to this year's M3 challenge problem, remote work, fad or future? The problem we were tasked with addressing is threefold. First, we developed a model to estimate the percentage of workers whose jobs will be remote ready for the, in five different cities in the US and UK for the years 2024 and 2027. In part two, we predicted whether a worker whose job is remote ready will be allowed to and choose to work from home. Finally, in part three, we developed a model to estimate the percentage of remote workers in a city, and then a metric by which to rank the five cities by the impact that remote work will have. Before we begin, note that we utilize the following 10 job sectors and 22 job codes defined by the BLS throughout our models to categorize employment. In order to keep the data consistent, we convert from code to sector by using a weighted average of the codes that make up each sector with the proportion of employees in each code as the weight. Now, beginning with part one. We first strove to create a model to estimate the percentage of workers whose jobs will be remote ready for a given city. We then applied this model to the cities Seattle, Omaha, Scranton, Liverpool, and Barrie for the years 2024 and 2027. To do this, we first had to determine that the proportion, uh, the overall proportion of jobs that are remote ready is based upon two things. One, the proportion of the workforce employed in each economic sector, and two, the proportion of jobs in each sector that are remote ready. Note that we are assuming that remote readiness in each sector is time invariant, as we only have data regarding the remote readiness of jobs for a single year, and therefore cannot model how this will change over time. In practice, improvements in technology will likely improve remote readiness across jobs in all sectors, but only up to a carrying capacity. As the spread of technology often follows a logistic curve, we expect that remote readiness will as well. So our goal is to model the proportion of jobs in a given sector in a city over time. And we start by saying that there are no major external changes upon a city. It's a relatively isolated system. We're also going to aggregate data by year. This will remove seasonal and other local fluctuations, which brings us to the assumption that the future state of the job market is based solely upon the current state of the job market. We represent this relationship with a function f, and by repeatedly applying this function, we can predict the state of the job market n years into the future. And it's important to note that we can't model the sectors independently. Because the elements of x are proportions, we have a global condition that they must sum to 1. To try and find f, we started by assuming that the proportion of jobs in a given sector at year t plus 1 is a linear combination of the proportions of jobs across all sectors during year t. And we represent this with matrix multiplication. And then by taking the nth power of the matrix, we can predict n years into the future. Our goal is to evaluate this linear model and then determine whether or not it's appropriate to the data and if we need to add any further corrective terms. So if we look at this vector equation at the top, it must be true for every year for which we have data about the economy. And we have around 30 years in the US and weaker data in the United Kingdom. But what we can do is we aggregate these independent vector equations into a single matrix equation as shown below. And it's important to note that this is a model. There's going to be some error term. And our goal is to find p by regression for every city such that we minimize the least squares error in the residual. Now, if we look at the general linear model for uh, multivariate regression, we have that the response variable is equal to the product of the explanatory variable and some coefficient matrix plus a residual matrix. And comparing this to our model, we see that in our equation, we're multiplying the matrices in the wrong order. So it's pretty easy to fix this. We just take the transpose of both sides. And then we're able to solve for the transition matrix using this formula, which we plug into Python. Now, to evaluate our model, we calculate r squared correlation coefficients from the residual and total sums of squares. And what we found is that for each of our five cities, the r squared coefficient was over 0.999. And so what we conclude is that our linear model is appropriate to the data, and we move on to results. And here we have a visual representation of our transition matrices, where the correlation runs from row to column. Darker colors indicate a stronger correlation, while lighter colors indicate a weaker correlation. Now, we can employ a Cindy check and look at the diagonal from the top left to the bottom right. We notice that it has many darker colors, which makes sense, because the job sectors should strongly correlate with themselves. And this trend continues in the other three transition matrices that we calculated. However, we also notice that our values and colors seem to be much more polar, 
In addition, we realize that our model is a regression and that extrapolations grow less accurate over time. Therefore, we concluded that our model is only appropriate over a short time scale. Oh. <laughs> we also have a graph and a model uh, for the increase and decline of job sectors for each city. Uh, a lot of these trends are ex easily explainable. For instance, the information sector in Seattle is increasing, which may be linked to the burgeoning CS and technology community in that city. We can also see the other three graphs here. We may note that in Barrie and, uh, sorry, yes, in Barry and Liverpool, uh, the job sectors and numbers seem to be fluctuating a lot, which may be due to the fact that we had weaker data and less input years for, their, for those cities. At last, we have the results, the proportions of remote-ready jobs in each city. Clearly, we can see that Seattle is increasing, while Scranton and Omaha remain more stable. Again, Barry and Liverpool seem to fluctuate a lot. However, the changes are only a few percentage points, because we only consider the changes in the job market, but not changes in remote readiness. In part two, we were tasked with creating a model to predict whether a worker whose job is remote ready will be allowed to and will choose to work from home. To solve this problem, we developed a rule fit model based on the worker's traits and circumstances. Data was used from the 2017 to 2018 American Time Use Survey, which included a module on schedule and workplace flexibilities. One question asked if the participant worked at home, which we used as the target variable, and responses for six other questions were used as the predictor variables as shown in this table. These included two numerical variables, age and child care, and four categorical variables, education level, occupation, spouse employment, and elderly care. To understand the rule fit algorithm, let's first take a look at the random forest algorithm for classification. Random forest generates decision trees where each parent node represents a decision rule and each leaf represents an output class. The outputs of all generated trees are then put to a majority vote to decide on a final output label. The problem with this algorithm is that as the number and depth of trees increases, the model becomes a black box. Rule fit solves this issue by combining the random forest algorithm with a logistic regression. The outputs of each decision tree are discarded, leaving only the decision rules used to split the trees. These rules are then used as predictors in a logistic regression as shown here. Logistic equations model binary outcomes and are relatively interpretable because their coefficients signal the impact of each predictor on the output. They also produce confidence scores for each prediction. To measure the significance of an individual decision rule, there are three metrics that we can use. The first is the rule's weight in the logistic equation as already discussed. The second is the rule's support, which is the percentage of data points to which the rule applies. And the third is the rule's importance, which is a function of the first two metrics. The importance increases with the weight of the rule in the logistic equation and is maximized when the support is 50%. We trained our model on data from 1,670 individuals. As can be seen in the table, the binary decision rules, as well as their three measures of significance, make for a very interpretable model. The presence of multiple predictors in each individual rule both accounts for collinearity and reduces dependence on any single variable. The model also incorporates missing data into its decision rules, represented by NA in the table. The interpretability of our decision rules allows us to extract patterns and trends from the model predictions. And we found that many of them were either intuitive or supported by scientific research. The model associated having higher levels of education, having children, having no spouse, or having an employed spouse, and working in math, computer science, or law as factors that generally make someone more likely to work from home. These rules are fairly logical, as the ones about children and spouse status would result in more household responsibilities for the worker. Additionally, having higher levels of education or working in one of the three aforementioned fields typically characterize occupations where physical presence is not as critical. To analyze our model, uh, we sliced our data set into training and testing data and then compared model predictions for individuals to whether they actually work from home. A summary of the model results is shown in this confusion matrix, which categorizes each prediction into one of four categories. The top left and bottom right of the matrix represent cases where the prediction was correct, and the top right and bottom left represent cases where it was not. It's worth noting that there was an, ex an exceptionally high number of false negatives, with nearly 600 remote workers out of 1,670 uh, total people uh, who were classified incorrectly by the model as non-remote workers instead. To further quantify our analysis, we looked at some specific metrics. Our model had a sensitivity of 0.31, meaning that barely 30% of actual remote workers were classified correctly by the model. It also had a specificity of 0.93, meaning that 93% of the non-remote workers were classified correctly. 
Finally, our model's overall accuracy was 61%, which is a bit better than 50% or random guessing. From the previous confusion matrix, as well as the metrics here, we determined that our model had a clear bias towards classifying people as non-remote workers. A possible explanation for this is in our data. The survey that we used was taken from 2017 to 2018, well before the COVID pandemic, and the current global sentiment towards remote work has changed enormously since then. So, in part three, we had to combine the part one and part two models to estimate the percentage of remote workers in a given city, and then rank the five cities from part one based on the magnitude of impact of remote work. So we chose to focus on economic impact, which is easily quantifiable in US dollars. Other forms of impact, such as a social impact or health-based impact, you would have to quantify somehow. It would make sense to also put that into dollars, and then we could build upon this baseline model. Now, research shows that people who work remotely will work more effective hours, and so we define economic impact as the excess value generated by a person's remote work if they work remotely. And we take value added by finding the proportion of extra hours that the worker works over the course of a year and multiply by the city's GDP per capita. If we had more precise data about the GDP per capita of specific sectors in a city, we could further plug that in to refine accuracy. Now, we can use our part one model to predict how many remote ready jobs there are in a given sector over time, and we can use the part two model and the demographic data of the person to then figure out whether or not they work remotely. So we know economic impact of a person, and we need to extend this notion to a city. If we consider the ideal population that's defined by the demographic distributions of a city, the actual city is just a finite sample of that, with sample mean equaling population mean. So what we have to do is find the expected value of economic impact. Now, we can't integrate directly due to the complexities of the part two model, so we instead run a Monte Carlo simulation in Python. Now, we use these seven independent variables, the first six we need for parts one and two, and then the final one for value added. And we're going to treat the change in the demographics of a city over the short time scale as fairly negligible compared to the change in the amount of remote ready jobs. Now, for many of these variables, we can find the distribution to sample over using pre-existing city data. We first start by generating a number from zero to one using the uniform distribution. Then we apply the inverse CDF to this uh, number in order to find the value of our desired variable, such as age and in 2024. We apply a similar process for other variables, notably age, education, uh, employment sector, and max weekly extra hours. You can see the very uh, distributions here in a bar graph. Then, to find the weeks per year that a person worked for extra hours, we use a binomial distribution with a 33% chance of success in 52, week, uh, 52 trials for each week in the year. We multiply this by the max extra hours per week that they'd be willing to work, and we find the extra hours per year that they put in. For the final three variables, we all realized that they were attributes of a household. Therefore, we decided to generate the household size using a Poisson distribution, which is truncated at zero to avoid all empty households. We found this distribution using the expected value formula and the mean household size of the city. Then, we followed this flowchart uh, in order to assign household members after assigned, uh, generating the household size. We first start with the worker, and then we assign the spouse status and elderly care status based off the marriage rates and elderly care rates in the city. Then for any unknown remaining people, we assign them as children. Here are the results of a Monte Carlo simulation. We can cl see, uh, clearly see that our graph is very right skewed, and there's a large amount of people who have absolutely no economic impact. This corresponds to the people who did not work remotely at all. Of the people who did work remotely, however, we realize that they're uh, value per capita decays very quickly. At last, we have the tabulated results of our Monte Carlo simulation, where we report the mean and the standard error. We see that our standard error is low, which means that our means are well approximated. So we decided to use the 2027 mean in order to rank the cities based on economic impact. As such, Liverpool, Omaha, and Scranton came out on top because of their high 2027 means. However, even though Seattle had a lower 2027 mean than Barrie, we decided to rank it above Barrie because we believe the 2027 mean was grossly underestimated, especially in consideration of the high 2024 mean. The 99th percentile of Seattle was actually zero economic impact. In addition, we realized that part two had a large tendency to report a false negative. So we believe that Seattle was actually underestimated in its 2027 mean and actually deserved to be higher than Barry, giving us our final ranking. Thank you. <laughs>
I'll start with a question about your, your part one model. So in part one, you had this, this transition matrix P. And as, as I understand it in the, in the paper, you had, you had mentioned some constraints on that matrix. Like it should be positive and I think the column should sum to one, which makes sense because you're trying to map a vector of probabilities to a vector of probabilities. When you showed us the equation for how you solved for P though, it didn't seem like those constraints were enforced. And in the, in the image you get for P, for example, there are negative values. So can you comment on that? Yeah, actually, so we, we spent a lot of time on the working this out. Um, so we originally came up with this model with analogy to Markov chains, where in fact, all in the transition matrix, you have probabilities. However, if you look at our vector X, these are not probabilities. These are proportions of the workforce, and the values in the transition matrix are just factors for dependence. So what we realized is the columns still have to sum to one, and then by properties of matrix multiplication, the vector X will sum to one, but the values can't actually be negative, and this makes sense. Because